Welcome to Nightmares and Grief, a place to explore and celebrate the darkness. Each episode, I'll read stories written by me, Derek Heisey. So settle in, check under the bed, and pour a drink for the skeletons in your closet. It's time to start. The Sophia warehouse was a mess. The ceiling tiles had spotty black roar shocks of mold and I needed to fumigate the vents because of the rats in the walls. From the second story upward, you had to play Indiana Jones because of all the weak spots in the floor. I don't understand why the city council didn't just condemn it. I guess enough people got together to cite its historical significance, but that doesn't hold water. The Sophia was an old building out in the industrial park possibly among the first from the city's original wave of expansion, but it wasn't anything more than abandoned brick warehouse. Teenagers didn't even hang out there. The giant oak in the city's park had more historical significance with the Quaker settlers who'd founded the place, but the city council cut it down almost five years ago. No clear reason why, either. Something vague about safety, but... Never any real explanation, so everyone filled the gaps in their understanding. I, you know, I'm not even sure if they really said anything about safety, come to think of it. Maybe I made that up. Restoring it was a big job. Our company had a streak of shit luck when the pandemic put a hold on construction in our area, so we were pretty close to desperate. A big job like this would pull us out of desperate and into better than okay. I decided to get the fumigation done before any major work got started. According to the blueprints, the easiest way to access the ventilation was on the fifth floor. Looking for it, I found a room that wasn't listed on the blueprints. Not a big deal, you know, they were old after all, and maybe the addition just never got incorporated with the city. Steamer trunks piled up to the ceiling there, old, sturdy, and caked with dust, but in great condition. No watermarks, no signs of weathering. In fact, the whole room felt sealed, like it was protected somehow. Something crackled in the air, like when you're too close to power lines. I don't don't know how to describe it but something illuminated the room. I wasn't looking forward to clearing it out, but the vents were inaccessible otherwise. The others were too busy with their own jobs and had enough on their plates, so I made sure my respirator was secure, put my goggles on, and got to it. The trunks were shockingly light. They looked like they'd be full of junk, but when I hoisted the first one off the stack, I nearly stumbled backwards from the extra force I put into it. I carried it out of the hidden storage room and opened it up. It was chock full of books. Nice books. Real leather clamshells. I inspected one, you know, color me curious, and the spine cracked on it like it had never been opened. That they were in pristine condition was impossible. Just by moving the trunk, I disturbed a quarter inch layer of dust. The books may as well have been fresh off the press, still warm from the printer. I checked the trunk's lid, inspecting the lip for a rubber seal or something, but there wasn't anything, nothing. Just a thin brass coating to protect the wood. I didn't have time to think about it, so I tossed the book back into the trunk. I didn't understand any of the words anyway. Printed in clean, bold ink, Lots of the pages had a round symbol containing three lines and two squat crosses. I popped a few others open. They were identical. Take them. Think about what they could do for you. I thought about the rats, about snapping their backs one by one and drinking their diseased blood. I imagined smearing the ceiling tile mold into every lung on the planet like a giant agar plate. I remembered the oak tree the city council cut down, 
and wondered what it would look like on fire. Looking back, I don't know if those were my thoughts or the books. I know that sounds weird. I know it doesn't make any sense, but I was influenced or something. It, it's not like it spoke to me. I'm not schizophrenic, but when I touched the book or looked at it, invasive thoughts popped into my head. They felt like mine. They felt real and natural and all that, but they were sudden, and unlike the sort of thing I would have thought at the time. I noticed little facts, fragments of memories, details around me I hadn't noticed before. Anyway, I dragged out the rest of the trunks without breaking a sweat, got into the vent, and gassed it like Belgium 1915. I wasn't aware of the intrusive thoughts until I came out. My head had been so quiet in the vents, and then the moment I laid eyes on the book, they returned, obsessive thoughts running around like they were paying rent. When I picked up the book off the trunk, it left a mark in the dust, but the cover was still pristine. Like I said, I'm curious, so I took it with me. Figured, you know, one missing book wouldn't be a big deal. and I could report it back to the city council after I'd taken a peek. They didn't seem too concerned about it if they even knew it existed. If the books were valuable, then they would have cleared them out ahead of time, right? Or they would have told me to keep a lookout for them. They wouldn't miss it. So I took it home. Picked up a couple little Caesars on the way home and watched a movie with my son. Some animated thing he'd heard about at school. The bad guys. It was cute. When it finished, I tucked him into bed and kissed his forehead. He seemed troubled. And just as I was about to leave, he asked why people thought the wolf was a bad guy to begin with. I told him that that's just what people do sometimes. They make assumptions based on what they know. He clapped back by asking me what they really knew about the wolf. He asked me if anyone had ever spent time with the wolf. The question was important to him. His eyes begged for an answer. I told him that I wasn't sure, but... It didn't seem like it from what was in the movie. His eyes got wet and shiny, and when I asked him if he was okay, he gulped and insisted that he was. Just tired, he said, and just wanted to go to sleep. I told him I loved him, and he said he loved me too. We left it at that. I turned off the light, closed the door, and, suddenly exhausted, decided I may as well turn in early too. It took a long time to fall asleep. Something put me on edge. I'd tense up thinking I heard something downstairs or bolt up in bed to check if something was in the room with me. I'm sure my mind was playing tricks, but I, I'd wake up almost as soon as I drifted to sleep, convinced that something stood in the far corner of the room. Until I turn on the light, I swear the space there was darker than the room around it. I twisted and turned, unsettled as smoke, so eventually I just I just got up and checked on Tommy. You know, I, I did that sometimes. Checked on Tommy. I, I guess a lot of single parents do that. I think it's a survival thing. Some remnant of an ancient instinct. Some primal fear for children. If there's only one pair of eyes to watch the kid, that pair must be twice as watchful never know what might go wrong. I cracked open the door and peered inside. The hallway nightlight cast a beam over my son's peaceful, sleeping face, and it made me smile. He was okay. Everything was okay. Except he was holding something. His arm was wrapped around a stuffed lion toy. 
He had some stuffed animals, but only enough to count on one hand. The boy was into Lego, Canucks, and Tonka. I, I think it might be because, you know, before his mother left, she was the one who bought him plushies. Even if he wasn't aware of the connection consciously, I think they still had a lingering association. But I didn't recognize this lion. It looked brand new, too. He was fast asleep and I didn't want to bother him, so I just made a mental note to ask him about it in the morning. Maybe he'd had it forever and I, I just didn't remember. It's not like I'm running a database after all, you know? I went back to bed, happy that my son was safe. But sleep didn't come any easier. I tossed and turned and couldn't find rest. I must have drifted away at some point because I had a dream. Even though the room was pitch black, I saw everything around me. Maybe, maybe saw is not the right word. I sensed the space, like when your ears prick up when someone's watching you or you shudder because you barely recall an ugly memory. I detected weak spots in the floor and knew every rat in the walls. The dense air was warm with the scent of spice and wet with mold. The Sophia warehouse. My skin crawled compelling me to turn away from the black windows and inward to the storage room. Golden light seeped out of the crack beneath the door, drifting up in curling tongues of mist. Now don't mistake me, the mist wasn't colored in light. The mist was light. Like, like, the, like the photons had coalesced into translucent tendrils. They squirmed out of the gap beneath the door, writhing in agony as they rose into the air and then dissipated. I'm curious, remember, so of course I opened the door. It didn't open like I expected it to, and I'm not sure how to describe the experience. It's like one of those optical illusions, like the, the one with the, uh, the champagne bottle's wire hood that makes something seem like it's turning in the opposite direction, that it's moving. The door seemed to open inward, even though its hinges were designed to open outward. Before me stretched a massive black hall, many times larger than the Sophia warehouse. All of it, pillars, ceiling, floor, sconces, statues, appeared to be carved from a single piece of obsidian trimmed with bright purple stones. I guessed to be amethyst. I, I don't know how I knew that. I don't know anything about rocks. But the deeper I stepped into the hall, the more I knew. It was, it was knowledge I already possessed and it simply lay dormant until I was ready to access it. I knew that the obsidian carvings were similar to the geometric patterns of mosques. Rather than being inspired by them, however, they were much older. They were, they were backwards somehow, like inverted. And I knew that the rug stretching from the entrance to the foot of the throne hid secrets in the designs. And I knew that at the end of the eternal hall, an entity sat. I tried approaching it, but didn't seem to get any closer. So I broke out into a sprint. Still, I didn't move. Space worked different here. I needed to advance in a different way to progress. With that realization, that uncovering of knowledge, I lurched forward. The hall rushed beneath my feet as I stood still and tense, sending me halfway down that forever space. When panic slashed at my chest, wielded by uncertainty and confusion, the hall moved again, but in the opposite direction. What 
is this place? My words filled the entire hall, but not in the shape of echoes. It seemed to fill it literally, like liquid poured into a mold. The hall advanced again. New knowledge came to me like a drop into a great pool, incorporating as if it had always been a part of the whole. This hall belonged to Marbos, keeper of secrets, hierophant of the hollow, regent of disease. Questions flooded from me like a burst dam. I hardly received an answer before I asked another, and the hall bolted by with impossible speed. How did, how did I get here? All men enter this place. It is no difficult thing. The challenge is in leaving. Why am I here? You seek and you sought, so you came. It is no difficult thing. Did the book bring me here? You found your way here by your own power. Why does the council want to restore the Sophia building? They, like you, conflate the ability of material things with their own power. Is it cursed? All things bear their own curses. For what felt like days, I asked Marbos question after question, moving deeper into the space but coming no closer. With every answer, I understood more but comprehended less until finally my heart asked, Why did my wife leave me? With these words, Marbos's throne rushed towards me. Great white horns sat like a crown atop his lion's head. His massive wings were black with razor-like feathers. Running a slender hand over his long red beard, Marbos answered, Because you are not enough. How can I become enough. You cannot. Will I ever be enough? Not for the things you seek. I stood directly before him now. He was still and beautiful, adorned in silken purple robes. I reached out to touch the mystifying fabric, and with that, something seemed to shift like a chair with a leg slightly broken at the joint. Everything disappeared, and I was back in my bed. I, I panicked, wondering how long I'd been out, but the red numbers on the clock beside my bed merely read 4.01 a.m. Days had passed, days of questions, days of answers, but I had only traversed a few hours. Despite my weariness, I, I, was, I was too wired to sleep. I checked on Tommy again. He hadn't moved an inch, but but the lion plushie was gone. I rubbed my eyes, and man, what a terrible dream. Rest didn't come that night. It would never come again. A few hours later, I was back at the Sophia warehouse. Sloppy, hardly able to focus, and a total wreck. One of the boys asked if I'd started drinking again. But I hadn't even looked at a drink since my wife left me. Too exhausted to keep my cool, I lashed out at the question. The guy backed up when he saw my hands clench into fists and apologized before I could clock him in the jaw. I, I went back to the attic in the middle of the day, wondering if I should take another book and get it appraised, but... But the trunks were gone. In fact, the whole room was nowhere to be found. I double-checked the floor plan to make sure I hadn't confused the vent's location in my exhausted state, but, but it wasn't there. According to the plans, the only access point was on the same floor, but, 
but all the way near the building's outer wall. I asked one of the guys if we'd fumigated the crawl space yet, and he looked at me funny. Said I must have inhaled some of the gas if I didn't remember. I called my contact at the city council and told her about the trunks and the books. I said the trunks had been stolen and asked her if she wanted me to file a police report. She said there was no record of the room, so she wasn't sure about the trunks. She told me not to worry about it. Around 3 p.m., I let a call from the school counselor go to voicemail. I knew what it said before I even listened. Tommy was acting out again. and She wanted to see me, and I told her last week that I wouldn't be able to see her until this week. When I'd asked then if she could just tell me over the phone, I could almost hear the gears turning in her head. She explained it was really best to go over it in person, but if I couldn't make it, she could give me a summary. Tommy had been getting into disputes. That's the word she used, disputes. I asked what was wrong with getting into arguments every now and then, but she hesitated again. These were more than arguments, she said. They bordered very close to violence. I, I'd been shocked at first, but I assumed she was blowing things out of proportion. I remember what it was like in elementary school when a teacher gets it in her head that a kid's bad. It doesn't matter if he's a saint, he's still bad. Any wrong the boy does gets blown out of proportion. I, I didn't trust his teacher, and I didn't have the patience to deal with the counselor's limp-wristed bullshit, so I told her I'd handle it at home. She tried one more time to get me to come into the school, but I shut it down. Told her to send me an email if it happened again. Tommy was curled into the couch when I got home. I made spaghetti and let him put as much shaky cheese on it as he wanted. He put on a movie, which he watched with sullen listlessness. He knew he'd done wrong and was waiting for me to drop the bomb. But I never did. It wasn't worth it. The boy had been through so much. He needed someone on his side. He didn't ask me any questions about the movie when I took him to bed this time. He just said goodnight, told me he loved me after I said it first. I saw Marboss again that night. I asked him, how can I help my son? Visions filled my head. Ice cream, playing catch, getting a dog, finding a new wife, beating my son. I saw millions of possibilities simultaneously as Tommy's future unfolded, each one branching out like a cosmic flowchart. And too many of them broke my heart. Tommy would improve, things would go well, but, but something else would happen a little down the way until eventually they all converged at the same point. No matter where he went in life, no matter what he did, 23 years from now, on February 12th, he would be hit by a bus. I saw Tommy cross a street in LA, in New York, Prague, London, Las Cruces, New Delhi, Constantinople. I saw him with his wife, with his son, with his three daughters, with a Labrador retriever wearing a service vest, infinite combinations of clothes, accoutrements, companions, expressions all coming to a head on February 12th. On my knees, weeping, I managed to sputter. I is that it? Is that? All he's meant to do? Despite everything he's gone through already, his fate is to get hit by a fucking bus? Yes. That's bullshit. Marboss didn't respond. How can I stop it from happening? You can't. Can you? I can. The world dropped out of my stomach. 
I'd been so angry, so blind with fury that I, I hadn't expected a yes. How? I asked him. You will remain in both places, here and there. You will stay at my feet until you have asked every question ever posed. In exchange, I will save your son. But he will grow to hate you. You will have no answers for him, even when he needs them most. You will try to keep your questions to yourself, but inevitably you will ask, and I will answer. I agreed. I, I didn't even think about it. I should have been more curious. I should have asked more questions. Eventually, they took my son away from me. He's been getting into a lot of fights lately. He punched a little girl named Maria who fought back. He hadn't expected her to, I guess. I'll need stitches. I asked Marbas if Tommy would be okay he shook his head. I asked him how to change it, how to make him okay, and he filled my head with visions, but then I remembered his promise. I'll never have answers for my son, not even when he needs them most. I lay at Marboss's feet and wept. It felt like I'd been there for centuries a scope of time that I can grasp now. I've always been here, and I'll never leave. Even as I'm telling you this, I'm there, prostrate before Marboss's feet, asking questions, but no closer to truth. Thank you for sharing my nightmares and helping me carry the grief. If you want to help the show, keep listening. Share your favorite story with a friend or family member. You can get early episodes by supporting me on Patreon, where I also share insights behind each story. Thanks again for spending this time with me. Peace. Peace.